I was very proud to be an American. I, I felt like this was the greatest country in the history of the world. I volunteered for the draft. It was an escape for me uh, to avoid attending college. My granddad fought in the war. My father fought in the war. This is what you were supposed to do if they wanted you. So that's what you did, even though it was wrong. You had no choice in it. I'm the first born Jewish son after the Holocaust. You don't just blindly follow. You don't just blindly obey. You stand up when you see something wrong. Your government, like any other government, can make mistakes. Danny and I grew up in Milwaukee. People in our neighborhoods didn't go to college. You graduated, you got your diploma from high school, and you got a full-time job. I lost my student deferment, and I remember staying in a barracks. And the boy who was on the upper bunk, he looked to be like 17 and a half. I couldn't even believe he was draft age. And he cried all night for his mother. And I felt horrible about that. And the only thing I felt I could do was to simply work harder to stop the war. Vietnam is an oppressed people that needs liberating. It's what I've trained for all my adult life. It's why I was in the Boy Scouts, trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly. All of that stuff is just a, of course I'll go to Vietnam. And for somebody to say that it's wrong to liberate the oppressed, that don't make sense. It was just so simple. So simple. <laughs> not, not so simple now. Form that we were going to be in the Black Lion Special Unit. And they told us all about it and how that Charlie was really scared of us. They had us pumped up the fact that we thought that we were invincible. You know, you were 20 years old and you were bulletproof. Well, maybe. I, basically, I don't think I give a shit about communists. Hey, if we're fighting communism, I don't care if you're fighting against flamingo dancers, OK? We're going to do whatever the government says. They own me. I got to do it. I was older. I was 23 years old. But the majority of the people that were there, the kids, you know, to me, they were kids, 18, 19, cherry boys. Some of them hadn't ever been with a woman. These were some great guys. They become your whole world. They're, they're more important to you at that time than your family because you know that they're going to be with you tomorrow. LZ, that big hill mass over there, it has a mountain. We trained hard, hard, hard. I taught a lot of the classes myself. They were good and they were bright. It was like I didn't want to go to sleep at night. And when I would sleep, I'd wake up thinking, Jesus Christ, here's something we could have added. The first day when you're standing there and it starts to rain and you see some shuffling around like, wait a minute, what do you guys think? We're going to go inside? What the hell's wrong with you? It's raining. So what? That develops into you've been shot in the arm. So what? Uh, your buddy's been killed. So what? They got better and better and better. I said, God damn proud of them. All I wanted to do was make a better company. All I wanted to do was make a better company. My Lacey, every day I can see my company get better and better. There's been quite a shift of people in our battalion. No one has thought too much of our battalion commander, and last night he finally got relieved. Lieutenant Colonel Allen is our commander now. As far as I know, he seems like a fine man. I said, you're not in relation to General Terry Allen, are you? And he said, yeah, I'm his son. And I just was absolutely flabbergasted by that. General Terry Allen, he was on a cover of Time magazine. 
it was very clear that my dad wanted nothing more than to be a general like his dad was. He very much wanted his father to be proud of him. I encouraged this. I very much wanted to be a general's wife. When I first met Terry, I was 18, so he would have been 31. It was very prestigious to marry into the Allen family. And in El Paso, there was no question that the war in Vietnam was a good thing. And we would go over and we would whip them and we would come back. And to me, Vietnam meant especially that this was Terry's opportunity to have combat duty. That was really the sum total of it in my own mind. When we returned to school in the fall of 67, a lot of things had changed since the spring. The, the war had picked up considerably. People were getting angrier and angrier and angrier about the war and the draft and the news that they were seeing, the images on television, the level of violence, the body counts, the bombings. It was all mounting. In the week ended last Saturday, 171 Americans were killed in combat, 977 were wounded. 193 Americans died in combat last week. U.S. combat deaths in the war now total more than 14,000. More and more people were trying to make a decision about where they would stand in relation to Vietnam. I was aware for the first time that there was a beginning of some kind of a movement. It was kind of mystifying, and it was also a bit threatening to me because I thought, what's going to happen here? Everyone was trying to get your attention, and one might be, a, a, you know, a petition to sign against the war in Vietnam. And, you know, I had very uh, suspicious feelings of these folks. If my government said we needed to be in Vietnam, then I believed we needed to be in Vietnam. I remember a group of us gathering and looking at the Daily Cardinal and seeing that Dow was coming to campus to recruit, which prompted a discussion that we had to start preparing for that. The best known product that Dow was making was Saran Wrap. The Dow Company began making napalm in 1965. The board chairman, the CEO, had served in the armed services in World War II that made it rather natural that when your government wanted you to make some, some stuff, even though it was very nasty stuff, that you made it. With, without any question. Napalm was this hideous jelly gas burning at 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. It didn't just kill you, it tortured you. It has a complete reference to Zykon B, the, the, the gas they use in the concentration camps. It felt like chemical warfare at its worst. Napalm was the symbol of the war. A year earlier, there'd been a huge story in Ramparts magazine talking about the effects that Napalm had on what it said were millions of children in Vietnam who'd been burned by it. The horror of Napalm made an indelible impression on all of us, and especially on students when they discovered that the, United, the University of Wisconsin had invited Dow Chemical Company to come to the campus to recruit. And the man who was to become the chancellor of the university shortly thereafter, William Sewell, he said, why can't they go and recruit off campus like they do in most places? Sewell was an opponent of the Vietnam War. He voted against allowing Dow to recruit on campus. 
but he was outvoted. The faculty endorsed their right to recruit, and the response of students who cared was that they had to do something if the faculty was not going to take a reasonable stand on this. People want to go work for Dow, that's their business. However, to use the university buildings to, in effect, provide a subsidy to Dow by providing them the space, we thought was absolutely wrong. I didn't want to see any more Vietnamese children running around with their clothes burned off. There were millions of us who thought that if we put in enough time and made enough noise, that it would make it impossible for the government to keep sending young men to Vietnam. In the fall of 1967, there were nearly a half million American troops in Vietnam. General Westmoreland, the commanding general, wanted another 100,000 or more, thinking that they could win the war through battles of attrition. Lyndon Johnson wanted body counts, and the pressure was flowing down on all of these battalions, like the Black Lions Battalion, to just go out into the jungle, search out the Viet Cong, and destroy them. We had some intelligence that a VC division were in this area. And so around the 10th of October, the Black Lions were sent back out, Terry Allen in command, and it was an exciting day. You would be out searching for base camp, searching for the enemy. And then at night, you would come back to what was called a night defensive position. We moved from one night defensive position to another, and it seemed like every day we, we made contact of some kind, maybe two or three people, maybe just a couple of rounds, sniper or something, you know. There was movement all around us. But you could just sense it in the air. You just get goosebumps. I live in the hills of East Tennessee. You don't come in my backyard and sneak up on me. I know every nook and every cranny. I know the creeks. You ain't going to sneak up on me in the woods in my hometown. You're not going in the jungle to Vietnam and sneak up on a VC. He knows where you're at. He knows where you're at before you ever leave base camp. My company was getting most of the action because I would go where the enemy was. I, I, I had a good feel for what the enemy was doing, but we were finding the enemy. I, I couldn't have dreamed that it was the entire regiment. My regiment had 1,200 soldiers. We weren't supposed to engage in any battles there. We were just passing through on our way to another mission. But we had no rice to eat for days. 